everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Messenger on a White Horse, The Life and Work of Robert J. Cox. My name is June Carolyn Ehrlich. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Revista, the Harvard Review of Latin America, and I'm going to be the moderator today. And together with me is my colleague, Kristen Weld. She's a professor of history at Harvard University. Welcome, Kristen. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Robert J. Cox. He's a British journalist and editor, and he was publisher of the Buenos Aires Herald during what's known as Argentine's Dirty War. And just this month, it was announced that he has won the Argentine Academy of Journalism Pluma de Oro, it sounds so much better in Spanish, the Golden Pen Award. Congratulations, Bob. Thank you. Ma, and our second speaker is Maud Daverio de Cox, Argentine writer and columnist, and coincidentally, Bob's wife. And Jason McNamara, he's the director of Messenger on a White Horse. And today we're going to be conversing with Robert J. Cox, whom we all know as Bob, about his work and the documentary Messenger on a White Horse. Um, the documentary, which I hope you've all had a chance to see, powerfully describes how in the late 70s, Bob Cox risked his life to publish news stories about the shocking, inhumane human rights crimes of Argentina's military dictators. Decades later, his life's work still has an impact on the human rights community, informing the search for truth, justice, and historical memory. This is very personal to me I met Bob in 1977, and I followed his life and intersected with him many times um, at Inter-American Press Association's meetings where he headed up human rights reports. And yet Jason's film gave me such new and deep insights as to what that period had been and what Bob and Maude had gone through. But before we start the discussion, I have a few boring housekeeping items to cover. First of all, we're recording today's webinar and it will be available in a couple of weeks on the Dr. Class YouTube channel. We'll also email a link to the recording to everyone who is registered. Second, we hope to see you at other lectures and series that we host here at Dr. Class. And in the chat, we're adding links of our online calendar as well as social media channels. So I'd encourage all of you to follow us there for the most up-to-date information on upcoming events. Next, it, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. I know a lot of you who are watching are journalists, and so I expect some really good questions. And from the academics, just prove you can ask better questions than the journalists. Mm -hmm. um, the chat dysfunction is going to be disabled, but if you have a question for any of the speakers, please put at the Q&A tab down below. Um, write in your questions. You can do that in Spanish or in English. And we'll be answering questions at the end of the session, but feel free to write them in when you think about them. Hay interpretación simultánea en español. There's simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. And to enable that, go down and click on the little globe on the bottom, that's the interpretation button, and select your language and to hear the original speaker audio select off. So here we go. Welcome, Bob, Maud, Jason. For Bob and Maud, first of all, 
in the process of making this documentary, what surprised you the most about revisiting that dark period of dictatorship? Did the process produce any new understandings of the context of your lives at that time? For me, it, it was uh, useful in that it helped me to expand my knowledge of, of the mothers. I got to know them as, as people, not so much as a movement and not so much. And it was marvelous to meet them again because if it hadn't been for the mothers, Argentina would have gone into an even darker place than it, that it did get to. These were in, in, in marvelous women, absolutely marvelous women. And it was uh, wonderful to, to be with them again. Um, was that a surprise? I suppose the, the surprise that I had that, that, that when we were able to get back to Argentina again, and then when we were talking to them during the film, I think what was alarming for me was that there was, it reminded me so much of what Hannah, Hannah Arendt said about the rise of Nazism in, in, in in, in Germany, that she was surprised that so few people stood up against it. And of course, the people who made the difference in Argentina were the mothers of Plessa and Major. They, they really, those are the rest of us in, who were trying to save decency and save human lives in Argentina played a smaller part than they did. They became the, they, they carried the banner of human rights. Maud? Well, I think uh, when you're living something, you just live through it and you just work through it uh, for when it happens. When you see it in a sort of documentary on a film, what I really think is you see that perhaps it was important what you did, but not, not because you did it in the moment, but for the whole world. Because you see there, especially as Jason was able to, I think, get it very well. You see, it's not, it's not only ideology, it's there's some things that are wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and it's not a, it wasn't taken as well, but this is how we feel and we're going to defend our people. I saw that that's why the, the film, the documentary is very important. Uh, there's some things that you cannot accept you, or you shouldn't accept uh, ever. Uh, and human rights is very important. And every little small story from Nicaragua, from here, from Russia, from uh, wherever you, or England or wherever, or the United States, that, shows that that cruelty that can happen because we're also, um, we're not at all perfect. We're so, such an imperfect humanity that it's very important for the world to know, to see, and it has, a, has, it has importance worldwide. And though it comes from a small country like Argentina compared to Britain and France and Germany, it is a small country. Uh, it's important. And if it comes from Britain, it's important. If it comes from Russia, it's important. Those private stories are very important. Thank you, Mike. Jason, you're an Australian all the way on the other side of the earth. How did you get interested in this subject? What led you to make this documentary and what did you find surprising in the process of making it? Yeah, thank you for, for having me. It's um, an honor always to speak with, alongside Bob and Maud. Um, the, so I, was, I moved to Argentina in 2013. Um, I was still in my 20s at the time and um, quite, quite naive, I think, about, about the world and especially about Argentine history. And um, I actually started working at the Herald as a, as a staff writer. So, um, yeah, without wanting to compare myself to Bob at all, um, I kind of found myself in some ways in his shoes, you know, like a recently arrived, you know, Anglo-Saxon uh, journalist working at the newspaper. And naturally, I eventually found out about his story and um, kind of lost interest in print journalism and became a little bit more interested in documentary filmmaking and, you know, found this really rich, interesting story to take to the, to the big screen, the small screen. 
and uh, yeah, and that's how it, that's how it began. And I started researching. Um, the documentary took about a year and a half to produce. Very independent, um, made on a shoestring kind of affair, and um, and then about a year spent post producing the film. And that was in two thousand and seventeen that it, that that it was released. So yeah, quite circumstantial, really. Um, and it's definitely opened up my 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 worldview and my understanding of of life and of humanity. And it's been a real thrill to 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 have such big life lessons um, through Bob and Maud's story. Well, you were, as you put, an Anglo journalist working at this small English language newspaper, and you'd heard of this guy. And when you actually got to meet him in Maud, what surprised you? Um, you know, I think I, it, nothing really surprised me, but I, if I do look back on that, situa on that situation of meeting Bob and Maud, I always tell people how, um, just how natural the whole experience of making this film was, because we really, I think Bob and I really understood each other. And, um, you know, we, this might be a little bit too nuanced, but, you know, uh, Bob is from um, East London and I'm Australian and, you know, even our accents are a little bit similar. We're both from working class backgrounds. So I think we just, we really understood each other. And we, we one thing I guess that did surprise me about Bob and about Maud as well is this really strong, palpable passion for Argentina, you know, um, Bob and Maud have been in contact with Argentina for 80 years. Maud is from Argentina, so all of her life. And, um, you know, this passion, this commitment and this optimism for Argentina is still as strong today in Bob and Maud as I think it always has been. And that for me is something that um, I try and hold on to and, and mention to people when, when we're talking about a country which has had so many ups and downs in the last 40 years, um, it is a special place. And, and I, I do agree with Bob and what I do think eventually it will get on its feet and, um, and move forward and be a country as it is, which has set some incredible precedents around truth, memory and justice, and which has a fantastic and really powerful um, civil society and an academia and an artistic community. Um, so yeah, that's one thing that surprised me and that I've learned a lot from, from Bob and Maud. Thank you. Bob and Maud, I'm gonna ask you a question that I get asked a lot, mostly in terms of my own work in El Salvador. And I find it very hard to explain this state of, on the one hand, always being in fear because there is a state of terror. And on the other hand, feeling no fear at all because you have your job to do, you have your family to raise and you just have to go and do it. And life is in some sense normal. And watching the film, I felt that was very much depicted, but at the same time, I didn't understand. I, I felt as confused as I do when I try to explain this about El Salvador. Because could you take a stab at that? I, 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 yeah, well, I worked it out. I worked it out. I, I, I decided that, um, and I, 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 I thought people had fear of flying. And I think I was frightened the first time I went on a plane, don't remember exactly, but, uh, but, but once you accept the fact that you're, if, you, if you fly, you're likely to crash. And I just accepted the fact that at any moment I might get murdered. So that meant that I did, in my mind, work out various ways in which I thought that I could evade that. But I, I just made a point of living a completely ordinary life, which is probably what you did, June. You just go ahead with your work. You just go ahead with what you're doing. And of course you make calculations in your mind. I mean, in Argentina at one time, you had the calculation, which with a colleague, Jim Nielsen, he once showed me, he, he carried a cutthroat razor. You know, those old fashioned razors. And she said he carried around with him. 
in case they tried to take him off because he was going to slash them so that he did, they wouldn't take him away to be t to torture him. So, so, and you deal with those things in a funny way and, because sometimes you, you laugh about them. Maud's entirely different, I think, and she can tell you something, but of course she was enormously helpful to me. I, I was not alone there. I had Maud and other people from time to time who I got through the sticky periods and one particular sticky period with Moenus, I said to myself, but why is it? Are we the only people who care about what's happening, who care about this horror? And, you know, the answer is we weren't, but there were a few of us. And I, and Maud, I own an enormous amount too. And I, I find it a ponderous title, The Life and Work of, of, of Robert Cox. It's really uh, the life of Maud and Robert in a way. I mean, I think she was stronger than I was in certain ways. And so apart from being in love with each other, which happened in strange circumstances in Argentina, really, um, I have an enormous admiration for her. And that helped enormously, helped enormously. Uh, that, that she believed in what we were doing, what I was doing, but it was really we were doing. Yes, I think that that's absolutely true. The truth is, is in, perhaps in my case, I was scared and I, I think I was more aware of the danger. I mean, Bob was working. I was in, in the house with the children. So my first was my protection for the children, but uh, very much so. I tried to keep a very uh, low profile in the sense I lived very much a bourgeois life and doing the right things. But at the same time, I definitely believed in human rights. That's something I had since I was small. Uh, I, I, I've written a book that, uh, first of all, I was interested. I was going back to my things I wrote when I was seven years old. We had a pen club, you know, the children had to, I was in American school in Argentina and you had these pen pals and these, so I had a little girl from, from uh, Canada, you know, the change letters. And I wrote to her all about what was happening in my country, that there was a president and he was dying. And if he died, I was seven years old. And if he was dying, you know, the nationalists would come. And if the nationalists come, who knows what was ha would happen. So I, first of all, we was very aware of what was happening in the world. This was 1937, 38, more or less. And then that, I think, kept me through that whatever happened, I saw that the German people from from my aspect in Argentina, we thought or that the German people did, accepted Hitler, which is not completely true. It, it, there were lots of people that always were against him. But in my little mind of seven years old, I thought everyone accepted this awful, terrible man. Um, and I, I think there I made my mind that whatever happened, I was going to be, you know, I was for who at that time we didn't call human rights, the rights of man, I imagine, the freedom, that's what I felt at seven, eight, nine. And that kept on, and when I met Bob, I think that's what put us together, the feeling of caring for what happened in humanity. And I think um, that when you asked before, when you live it, you live it. Fear, yes, I was fear, fearful, but I always was more fearful of my children. And, and when we decided to leave, it was I who made Bob leave, because I saw the children already was uh, they were a target. They were already pointing to my children. And I didn't, don't think it's fair to do that. I, I didn't think it was fair. I thought each person has to live their own life and choose how, how they live. I think that might answer the question. No, we had to leave them because it was, by that time, I was aware that they were likely. To, to begin with, I believed that military people were honorable men. Uh, undoubtedly, many of them are. In, in the case of Argentina, they lost what honor they ever had because something happened to them. I don't know how to explain that to this day. And when I realized that uh, they were likely, I, before I thought they, it doesn't matter what they happened to me because the only thing I can hope for that if they do kill me, that it has some effect, that it has some effect, that, that, that it will help to stop what was then a, a, a machine of murder. But I never thought that they would go after my wife or my children. And then I realized that they would because they had already started to do that. And there was no limit to them because they were out of control. Uh, in the, in the, 
were out of control. In the document, in the documentary, you make the mention of a comment, I think it was by Videla, about Lazarus, and that at the time you did not understand what he was saying, that all those journalists had been killed. Was that because of your respect for the military or did you just simply not understand? Well, no, I, 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 you know, I chased the military to say, you've got to stop this, you've got to, and I, they would complain that we shouldn't, that we were helping communism by publishing what we did, which was a, a people who had disappeared. And I said, well, I'm not that interested in what I want this, where are these people? And I know that they've been picked up by. So I'm going to come with a list of names and you tell me where they are. And whatever, if they're guilty of something, you put them on trial or anything like that. That's what I want. That's OK. Uh, and in this particular instance, I chased, it was the interior minister, General Argindegi, who was a brute of a man. Uh, and I chased him to his office, not realizing that I had a, uh, the, uh, the, um, a, uh, at that time, a huge tape recorder, and they were huge at that time, like a you know, like a loaf of bread, almost a large loaf of bread, mm -hmm. and it was on because I, they called us in to tell us to behave during the World Cup. All the editors were called in, and I just chased him as I always did because I chased him with a list of names of journalists who disappeared, and then to bring it up again and say you've got to do something for the best of the mind, you can't go on the way you're doing, and in the course of this. I didn't really, I didn't, wasn't kind of listening. It wasn't until later on that the tape recorder was played and he, you hear him quite seriously saying, well, I am not, I'm not Jesus. Jesus Christ. I can't say Lazarus rise again. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized that, that he was telling me that they were murdering the people as they went along. When we left Argentina, I and many friends, including Marshal Rabbi Meyer, the wonderful rabbi, American rabbi who gave his life for Argentina, really. And he too believed that there were that the missing were probably being held in different places and that eventually the military would put them on trial or do something about that. So that's essentially what happened in that case. I, I, uh, to begin with, we knew nothing. I mean, we, and we had to go out and find out what was happening because the rest of the press just collapsed or they were, you know, they were in a way working. I, I don't want to be unfair to people because it's not an easy situation to be in. And it's a decision that anybody who had a chance to say something at that time needed to make. And of course, in my case, I did. I did have it. And so I was able to, to, to do something that way. But uh, the, 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 the country was essentially closed down in that time. There were, the, the, the major. I think everyone expected to see their children alive or husband sometime. The one that was a, a very aware, was most aware suddenly. I remember I was in the, my flat in, in Buenos Aires and suddenly the bell rings. Bob wasn't there at midday. It was surprising and who it was was Tex Harris this American diplomat. And he said, he came in because he didn't usually come in, but he had to come in, he said, Bob's here. I said, no. He said, do you mind giving me a whiskey? So I bought him a whiskey or wine, whatever he asked, I don't remember this moment. And he said, I've just come with me with the children, so I'm still more playing happily in the, in, the, in the park. And suddenly we hear a bomb and a whole um, building fell down. And my God, he said, it was where they kept the, the, the prisoners. I knew at that time they were keeping some prisoners there. So that was my first, uh, my first, is that he suddenly felt because he knew the place well. And he had, was playing there with the balloons with the children and he couldn't stand it. So he put a smile on it and he must, have, the wife must have taken the children home and he came to my house because he had to talk to Bob, but most of you could see him absolutely shaken to find out the truth. That was the time when the military were trying to cover up the fact that they were clandestine prisons because they were expecting a visit from the uh, the inter-American uh, inter 
every case, I'm sorry. Yeah, but we all had hopes in the whole world. All the time, we had hopes. Um, we knew terrible things were happening. We knew that killings and all this happened, but we've been we used to in a way because the killing story started massively in 1970, uh, which at that time it was in the in the streets. I remember, and funny enough, reading this book that I'm reading, which is I really recommend everyone to read it, um, the, the life of a man uh, called the magician, and. You see in Germany at that time, which I did not realize that that was happening in Germany just before Hitler came. Not only the money, but it was a whole pile of people killing one another. So uh, it's one of those things that happen when things uh, go very bad in a country. But then the, one has to be very careful that the next person that comes in does not go into a complete madness uh, and power. Well, Argentina, the, the worst happened because there was no press. There was no press operating, essentially. That's what it came down to. So and there people, was always censorship in Argentina. Well, people knew what was happening, but they didn't see it in their newspapers. They didn't hear it on the radio or on, on television. And they tended not to want to talk about it. So that made things very difficult. Um, I learned a lot from Jason's film in that it made me realize how close the Argentine military had come to repeating what the Nazi Nazis did in, in Germany. Um, I, I was born in the year that Hitler came to power, and I'd never really taken that into consideration. I lived through the Blitz in London. Um, and Maud, we had this in common, that we were aware of what had happened, of the rise of Nazism, of the anti-Semitism, of the, this appalling period of, of massacre of millions of people. And I, everything that was not their perfection, which is the, the man, the husband, wife, each one had the role, and, and that anything that was out of that bothered the Nazism. So anti-Semitism, anti-gays, anti-women, really, in a way. And the lessons, I think Jason just mentioned, you get a life lesson now when I look at the film, which I think is wonderful because it, it, it tells a story in a way which I never wanted to or never could. And I wouldn't have been able to write about myself. I can't write about myself. I, I, I believe in journalists who you don't see them. Um, I wrote once and my idea of a good journalist is somebody who's wearing a shabby raincoat and stands in the corner and sees what's happening and takes it all down in those days with a notebook. Now, I don't know, you just, you know what you do. I think journalism's changed so very much that we've got to grapple with that because lots of the good things of the old journalism are dying or going away and they've got to be retained. And uh, that's one of the lessons that comes out of what happened in Argentina. In Argentina, it would not have happened if the major newspapers who were independent, they could have done what they wanted to, just published a letter from one of the others of Plaza de Mayo, allow them talk to the mothers of Plaza, but they ignore the mothers. That's why the mothers are the key to everything. My God, how they suffered because of it, the mothers. But if it hadn't been for them, I don't know what would have happened in Argentina. It would have gone on and on and on. And I mean, I learned later more about the military that they had plans to expand. They wanted a nuclear weapon and they, they were going to go first for Chile and they nearly did. They had airplanes in the air and the Pope stopped that. They believed that they could conquer. I mean, they yeah. believed that they could do what the Nazis tried to do. And it sounds impossible, but it's true. Those are the things that uh, wouldn't have happened if, if you'd had a press that just reported what was happening. That's all they needed to do. They didn't even need to make any comments. They didn't write editorials or anything like that. They just need to put some of the facts in the, in, in the paper. That, you know, and they didn't do that. Later on, they did, thank God. And I think Argentine journalism now... And I think Argentina has had a vaccination that has against violence in, in general, apart from criminal violence. But those are things that you can't do anything about. But in the idea of institutionalized violence, I think Argentina is saved from that now. No, yeah, and the press is very open. And the press, the press is, is open very now. Open. Yeah. So you knew to a large extent what was going on. And yet you did this very difficult um thing of like 
writing and reporting to the edge uh, because you had to keep the paper open. Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah, I had to do that. And to do that, we became a fantastic newspaper in regard to the fact that we, we dealt with human rights all over the world and we didn't, the argument was that, uh, that uh, you know, the press only makes a big fuss because uh, it, it's a, a right-wing government and they don't bother about left-wing dictatorships and it just wasn't true. And so we, we would publish as much as we could about covering that without becoming, we tried to be a normal newspaper at the same time. But yes, we were always on the edge and we had to watch out that they didn't plant false news so that then they could denounce us as, as but they never managed to do that. And I had wonderful people working with me and there was a wonderful spirit in the newspaper. And, this, and it wasn't a, in any way a political thing. We have people there, I suppose, of all kinds of political ideas, but you know, the one idea of human rights which can unite everybody is something that I saw in action in a tiny little newspaper, and which I think can spread around. I think that journalists need to realize that their major duty is to defend human rights under all circumstances, regardless of regimes or anything like that. And I think that can, is something that can spread. It's an idea that can spread. Thank you. Matt Ma, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, no, I, 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 what's, the, I, I, what's the question exactly? Not a question, I was just talking about human rights and well, that's defense why, of human well, rights. I think I should explain it before. I mm -hmm. think human rights is so important, so, so important that it should be, and I think it's getting there, but it's going to take a long time. I remember once in Argentina taking a taxi and the man turned around and said, oh, que es eso de los derechos humanos, because it, Nobody had heard of those words. I mean, we all studied at school, right? The rights of a man, and, but they never heard it as a as a obvious thing that it would, should happen to everybody, to the lowest worker, to the highest, to multi multi billionaire. Um, and that's one thing, and we have to think of Carter in a way that he. I think the Americans don't realize that he was a good president for the whole world. He might have made mistakes here, perhaps, but as far as the world, he gave that right. He made it important, he made people talk about human rights. The rights that everyone has, doesn't matter what, what nationality, what religion you have. Um, but there are things that are wrong and wrong, fine. The things that are wrong should be judged accordingly to the rules of the country, of the place, of the state. But... Uh, I think that's that's very important, and people nowadays are thinking in those terms. Not many; it's always less, but more than much more than before. Uh, there is a, there are people right now trying to go back and regress, and I think the reason they want to regress and go back to old-fashioned things is because they have an idea because of their ignorance, cultural ignorance. They had a nice idea; they were very happy once upon a time. And they don't realize the world has changed and for the better, but it hasn't touched them yet. But little by little things, even this generation, I think is much better than other generations uh, with, all the, with all their faults. But they have more sense of, you know, I'm a person, I'm a citizen, I have a right. And that's very important. Thank you, Maud. I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Professor Kirsten Well to uh, comment on the historical context and to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Um, thanks, June. Um, and you know, thanks to all of you for being here. And I apologize for my voice being slightly blown out. Um, I wanted to just ask a couple of questions because I think we're all more interested in hearing what Bob and Maud and Jason have to say than hearing what I have to say. Um, so I have a, a kind of a historical question. Um, a political question that digs into something that I thought the film was a little bit um, coy or ambiguous about, um, and then something of a personal question. So, and you can take up any, all, or none of these as you feel appropriate. Um, the historical question has to do with uh, sort of connecting some of the focus and the orientation of the film 
to um, some of the newer questions um, and areas of focus in the contemporary historical scholarship on the Argentine dictatorship, um, as well as contemporary waves of activism um, pertaining to memory and the aftermath of the Argentine dictatorship. And the, the sort of direction where um, the kind of cutting edge scholarship and the most recent waves of activism has been going in um, is kind of summed up by the slogan, los grupos económicos también fueron la dictadura, right? The economic groups were also the dictatorship. Um, and not only in Argentina, but in other contemporaneous regional contexts, such as Chile um, or Brazil, right? So the idea there being that there was a logic to the campaign of violence that the Argentine military undertook in alliance with local elites, particularly business elites, um, that this was not just you know, isolated sort of sadism or psychopathy on the part of a handful of generals, um, and it wasn't only about getting rid of a group of idealistic kids who wanted a better world, right? It was also actually about dismantling organized labor. It was about getting rid of activist workers on the shop floors of factories at Ford and Mercedes plants. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious if that element of the um, kind of combustible mix of, of the dictatorship was something that you perceived at the time um, in your work as a journalist, or if it's something that you have thoughts on now in retrospect? No, so that's the historical it's a, question. It's a big question. Maybe you just want to yeah, no, jump I'm, into I'm, that before I'm, I learn much about that stuff. Because it, it, it's very important, but the thing is, it, it, you, you need a certain amount of balance on this. I think the best way to do it is that uh, very soon after the coup, after the military took over, I, at that time I used to work for everybody because I need to make a living. And I worked one time for about 10 different publications, including the New York Times and the Washington Post at the same time until the New York Times didn't like that very much. But the, 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 New York, um, the Economist sent one of their guys out, very nice guy, very conservative as it happened, um, who was later a conservative MP in England. He came out and I just took him around to meet people. And uh, when we'd met a few of them, he said to me, you know, he says, they have a whole plan. And he was right. He, I mean, the, the, but it, it, it depends on which political slant you put it at. What they wanted to do the, 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 uh, in regard to the econ economics and Martinez de Oz, who was the economy minister that they chose, the man that they chose to be their economy minister, they wanted to, they wanted to, yes, they wanted to uh, tame the, uh, the, the, the trade unions. They had an idea of, a, of a, a different kind of economy. They wanted to reform Argentina according to their ideas. Well, they were pretty bad ideas, as it happened. They weren't. So I, I don't see it as a kind of conspiracy. Certainly what they wanted to do was to transform Argentina. I'd mentioned the military side of it too, because the, the civilians didn't seem to understand that the military had become brutes and that they were capable of going and doing anything until they started to kill them too. The, you, you get, you've got young, 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 um, People from Harvard, for example, would go, go back to Argentina and feel they wanted to give something to their country. And at that time, we'd had a series of military governments and the military were essentially in control in Argentina, had enormous control over the economy. And they wanted to serve their government. And they had ideas that were sort of, I don't like to use the word liberal because it's so misused, but essentially they wanted to, I suppose, get away from Peronism or, or fascism, because the two are very close. Um, uh, but that, but it, I don't, honestly, my opinion is, is that the, the military themselves were all tangled up and they didn't know quite what they were up to. I don't see it in that way. I, I, I imagine that if, you know, I'm not an academic, I just live through it all. So I know how they felt about things. And the military, most of them were totally opposed to what Martinez were doing. And they eventually got him out after he'd made a tremendous failure. Now that doesn't 
you know, those kind of things are messy, but that's the truth. The, the human truth is so messy and it's difficult to get it across. No, I think you're right. Um, and Maud has got it very closely. Yeah. You know, when you're there and living through it all, and then you have, uh, Jason's film is great, I think, because he's captured, I think, which is the main thing there, is, is the mothers of Placid Maja. Um, and I hope he goes on to do more work on this. Because it's it's a lesson to be learned the way the military were, and then we use the military in that term. And how do I do that? You know, there were people who were on the extreme right, and there were straightforward murderers. Videla, again, how do you capture this? Is he was a man who was had no character, really, and he finds himself to be be president. He doesn't know what to do exactly, and not a bad man. But then he. He decided because the civilians got to him too beforehand and said to him, look, and, he, and then they decided they had to, and he eventually at the end of his life, after denying it for years and years and years, some of the time in prison, some of the time out of prison, said, yes, we killed between six and 7,000 people. They killed a lot more than that. Nobody to this day knows how many, but that's what they did. They set out to do that. They believed that they were fighting godless communism. They believed that the United States was behind on all this and that Argentina would emerge as the new, the new wonderful country. You know, obviously, I can't even give it a name. I can't even say it's fascist, but that's what they wanted. And I suppose I should do more work on them trying to understand why they didn't. It doesn't fit the, you know, the, it doesn't fit the, the, the sort of, you know, the... No, I don't, and it the wasn't, few, it wasn't know. united. If, if they weren't they did, united, they were different, fighting different each other, ideas. they killed each yeah, other. For, for economic reasons, it wasn't just that you're going this way, and that's mm -hmm. why. Uh, I thought perhaps you'd like to hear about my father. My father was a very ordinary person. He was a businessman. He, he did well, but just very ordinary. And uh, one day he said, said to me, he always was protesting against the trade unions. They can't do this and we can't do that. You know, the usual thing. This is 1950. And, when, and one day he laughed and he said, the fact is, he said, the trade unions are pretty bad, but the other side, we, the, the industrialists, are even worse. I thought that would be rather interesting because this comes from a common man, a man of the, you know, he was a political man. But he saw, he, this is what he said, the trade union is pretty bad, but we, the industrialists, can be even worse. You know, laughing that what life is, that's the way he saw it. Argentina and Argentine history is perplexing. Um, and it's very important to look at the perplexity of it. And as they say, they, um, it's complicated. It is truly complicated, but it's better to really look at the actual events that happened and how they happened. Uh, I mean, and look again, the military would have probably still be in a pretty good position if they hadn't decided that the way that they could get out of their problems at that time was to invade the Falkland Islands or in the, the Malvinas Islands, and they, they lost, and they, they were discredited, totally discredited. And, and one of the reasons they invaded was to get people to think of something else, and that we exactly. know because yeah. they even, the person who came with a to the States phoned me up and said, it's one way to get rid of the disappeared. You know, say they were in the war and they were killed in the... But can I just say on the... Um, <clears throat> sorry, Maud. Can I just no, say on the, the, the issue of the economic conspiracy? I've spent a bit of time in Argentina in the last couple of years, and there's definitely, uh, I think, kind of two aspects to your question, um, Kirsten. One is the kind of historical ongoing conflict between two visions for Argentina in economic terms. And that's still, that's still the case in Argentina today. I think you see that the human rights movement, the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, the, the survivors of the dictatorship tend to have aligned more with kind of the Peronist ideology and ideas around economic sovereignty and about, you know, having a, a strong service industry, manufacturing um, versus the kind of liberal, um, liberal minded community in Argentina, which is, I would say more than any, uh, anything, it's the, the, the ideology is anti peronism basically. Um, but in economic terms, there's a tendency to look towards opening Argentina up. That's been the case in Argentina historically. And I think 
about what you and it and the role of the business community and the liberal elite in Argentina in the dictatorship today is used, I think, as um, sort of a warning or a criticism uh, about what uh, what could happen to Argentina if the liberal community were to take Argentina down that path. Um, so there's a little bit of kind of opportunism, I think, in in and, and historical revisionism, where that where that kind of idea of an economic conspiracy uh, behind the dictatorship is inflated a little bit. I think what you really have in the context of the dictatorship is um, is is opportunism. You know, business leaders, even you know, private individuals. There's cases of of disappeared families having their assets taken. Um, you have, um, you know, if you look at the way the army and the Navy were operating separate clandestine detention centers, no one, the army didn't know what the Navy was doing. The Navy didn't know what the Air Force was doing. And in that chaos, in that confusion, I think you have a lot of uh, private individuals and private companies really making the most of what is essentially, um, you know, the breakdown of the country. A lot of people and a lot of businesses who took the opportunity to uh, to steal, essentially, in that context, are still the same businesses and private individuals who manage a lot of power in Argentina today. And I think the focus at the moment, especially on the left, given that a lot of the uh, human rights crimes have been tried is to try and turn the judiciary's attention towards, um, you know, the the nature and kind of and ask, you know, is there a statute of limitations on economic crimes committed in the context of a dictatorship? So that's I think is what is happening in Argentina today. I don't imagine that's going to be too successful. I don't think there's an appetite in Argentina anymore to continually go back over the dictatorship. Um, and I think you kind of see that in the emergence of sort of alt-right political movements um, and a real fall from grace uh, of, of the Peronist left, which is kind of really struggling now to keep hold of power. That's true. I think it's a very good picture. Yes, I think it's yes, yes, and yes, I think it is in 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 general terms. I, again, it's it's more complicated naturally than that. Argentina being Argentina, but uh, it's not a. No, it's not. It wasn't done. I mean, the revolution or the military coup was not only done economically. That that's not true because there were lots of factors, and the most important factor was a human life. So people were. Even the people were tired of all this, and um... we have this awful problem about the word terrorism. The military tried to give the impression that any opposition to them was an, a, almost an act of terrorism, and so that you had what you had too. After all, there you did have an attempt at a takeover of Argentina sponsored to some extent by Cuba. I don't know exactly how far, but uh, trained in Cuba. And so you, and you had little armies set up and they, who were trying to bring down the government. And you had a situation where the right wing were answering it already underground. There's an underground war, there were masses of murders yes, beforehand. Yeah. Every day there were, it was, it was an appalling chaos. situation, so it seemed chaos. So then the idea that Argentina seemed to have every so often was, well, let's let the military come in and they'll clear everything up. And at one time, I actually met some political scientists who were arguing that for Latin America, it's probably, uh, you know, traditional, uh, um, the traditional idea of how government is replaced is probably necessary and it works very well. You bring in the military and they, but of course you brought in the military and things got worse. They didn't get better always, on any always, occasion. Always, always. Uh, it's um... like the, the parent that says, I'll try and give, give them a big punishment so he won't do it again. And it might not, it might stop the child stops for about one day or two days and then it gets worse. They think of a way of going against the, the head of a family who's 
punishing them. The problem in Argentina now is that people don't talk to each other and they just cut themselves off because that was one of the problems during the during the regime that there was no there's no kin you know there's no empathy no empathy for the suffering of which they you know finally knew about but it's difficult for people to know about it so a lot of the things that happened in Argentina were late too late they came too late because by that time but fortunately other circumstances like the lunatic war that the military embarked upon is the way military regimes usually do or like Putin is doing today embark on an, a military operation a military enterprise and uh, so when they did that and that was the end of the military because they failed if they if they'd have been successful they would have certainly got many many more years of power a story today so I suppose that's what Putin imagines too. So th thank God he seems to be stopped to some extent, but it makes it quite clear for me. I mean, I find there's so many parallels between what's happening in, in the Ukraine today and except the enormous courage, the massive courage of the Ukrainian people, which I think is very, very admirable. Uh, I, I imagine that some people are trying to, you know, cut that down, but I don't think that can be. I mean, that, that has to be recognized. And it's an important thing to do because it's the right thing to do. In this world that we have at the moment, I think it's very important for people to decide what is right and to go for it and to insist on it, regardless of what's happened. And I think that's what Maud and I did. We, we, we decided that what was happening was wrong. We had to say that it was wrong and we had to give the facts. And we had, And also we had to comfort people like we comforted the mothers because we to be comforted. It's, um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Ukraine. The, there was a, a different contemporary context that I was going to mention that yeah. the film made me think about, which was Mexico, um, yeah. in terms of thinking about journalism and journalism and journalists under siege. Um, and uh, very, very, very I happen to be, um, I'm, I'm teaching a course right now in um, modern Mexican history and my students and I for tomorrow are reading this wonderful meditation by Cristina Rivera Garza, which is called Grieving. And it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's sort of partly poetry, partly cronica, uh, partly political essay, but really sort of trying to, to, to reckon with um, the, the brutal reality of contemporary Mexico. And she has uh, a line in here where she writes, and it was, I was just rereading this for my class and it just pinged out to me from mm -hmm. having rewatched the film, where she writes, can writing keep us company? We, the broken ones, still alive with rage and hope. I believe writing can indeed, and at the very least writing should. As demonstrated by the brave journalists who have lent ears to the voices of hundreds of thousands of victims, writing gives us the tools to articulate the mute disarticulation we face on a daily basis. And that's the end of her quote. Absolutely. And I was thinking, and then she gets into this, this explanation of her analysis of the relationship between writing and grieving. And I, the reason that I was thinking of the film and your experience as I was rereading this passage is because one of the things that is very palpable in the film, Bob, is your own grief um, and the emotional experience that you were going through as you were you know, struggling to testify. It seemed like you were grieving a whole set of things beyond simply just the, the sort of the deep empathy, of course, that you felt for the Madres who were sharing their testimonies with you, but you were also, it seemed, I hope this isn't too personal uh, uh, a kind of thing to impute, but you also seem to be grieving a kind of idea that you had previously had about Argentina, right? A set of ideas that you'd already mentioned about the sort of essential honor of military institutions and military men, um, a certain kind of experience of being a young journalist, right, that that you were not going to get to have anymore, an experience that had maybe been more carefree um, that you had to leave behind because you were pulled along the, the trail of the stories that um, were being shared with you by the Madres. And so um, I was just thinking a little bit about and wanted to invite you to reflect a little bit on the relationship of, of writing and grieving. Um, I'm also curious if you've done other kinds of writing. You just said a moment ago that you, you can't write about yourself. Um, but of course we all have private lives that we don't share. I gather that Maud has written 
a memoir about some aspect of her experience of these years and maybe that your son has also yes, published a yes, book about yes, this yes. and so I was just wanted to invite you to speak a little bit about um, maybe other kinds of writing that you've done that have been a complement um, to the sort of more journalistic work that you've done to, to manage um, and to process um, the, 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 just the way that this experience, you know, sort of changed the trajectory of, of your lives. Well, Maud has, well, Maud has written five books. Five, I did not know about five. I would love to hear about the writing that you've done, Maud. About many, many, many things. I haven't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a journalist and- uh, Sometimes journalists do other kinds of writing. Write, if I wanted to write, I wanted to write about the newspaper itself which was quite extraordinary and it's an extraordinary time. There's a certain romance about it and so on. But no, I... I, I, I you've written about Cuba. You oh, yes, yes, you yes, 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 yes. Yeah, no. You've written quite a few books. But journalism, journalism... But not a book. You know, and journalism is whatever it is they say. It's the, the, the you know, the rough draft of history because journalism is useful. And I think we're realizing that as we see it being lost in some ways. Um, but Maud has written very, very extensively about uh, coincidences is a very successful book. Uh, no, the, the fact is that uh, you've written a lot, a lot, a lot with short stories and, and things like that, uh, but you don't want to write, you can't write a book. because I wouldn't write about myself or yeah, my experience. Yes, no. exactly. That's a personality. Well, then it had to be yeah. uncomfortable then watching this film that's all about you. Oh, no. it is. It is, except that I think Jason got it right, because I never really got the idea that growing up in London during the war obviously did have an effect on me when I faced, because it wasn't so unusual for me. I, as a little kid, decided, well, the Germans are going to come and we're, they're not going to, you know, whatever happens, a Ukraine-like feeling. Absolutely. If they kill us all, it doesn't matter, but we, I mean, at seven years old, I thought that. So... So in that way, I, I, it was a, well, I, I, I couldn't possibly have imagined at the time, but watching Jason's you film and, and seeing, you know, the kids who were, I didn't, I, for some reason, my parents kept me in London during height of the Blitz and, and we had a marvellous time. I thought it was glorious. It was a glorious war. It was seven or eight year old and we had a lovely time in a way. And we just didn't, these Germans, they aren't, you know, we're going to deal with them when they come. And we made plans and silly things like that. But so that, and then I felt many, you know, Ukraine, I feel that the Ukrainians are the same way, except of course, it's so appalling. I mean, the, the murder and, and the destruction, how do we deal with that? I mean, that's going to be awfully difficult for all of us. I think it's going to be a psychological for all, problem the whole world. for all of us to deal with this mass destruction that we can now watch as it happens. And it's horrifying, horrifying, horrifying. I don't think we've ever uh, had I, anything like this before. Not that I know of. Can, can, world can I say... Um, you can't do anything about it. <clears throat> Kirsten, that um, Bob, Maud is a fantastic writer. I think I'm, I have all of her books and I recommend anyone getting a copy of them. There's some fantastic sort of, Maud, I think Maud is great at anecdotes and she has some books which really like put you in her shoes as a young girl living in, you know, growing up in a different Argentina. And um, Bob uh, has uh, some of the texts that I read a lot of yours of, Bob, I don't think that you're writing anymore or much more for the Buenos Aires Times, but as a columnist, um, Bob, I think in the last decade or so, you've uh, covered Argentina from your perspective uh, in a really interesting way. And a lot of that material is available online. So um, I'd recommend anyone to look up the Buenos Aires Times, uh, you know, Bob Cox columns. I enjoyed that because it was a time to go back to Argentina and there was still hope. I mean, one, Argentina is a difficult country. This is a difficult country. Um, and you have to be in love with it because otherwise you, you won't, wouldn't put up with it um, in a way. We unfortunately had to leave there, and, but probably we were fortunate we did because I don't think we'd be alive today if not. I don't know exactly, but certainly something terrible could have happened to us and would have happened to us. But, uh, you know, uh, and so, you you know, it, it, and I do so agree with Jason that there's so much good about Argentina that needs to be cherished through the difficult times. And 
it sometimes isn't easy. It, perhaps it's easier for us who, 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 who make the decision to fall in love with Argentina despite everything. I guess like I fell in love with Maud. It wasn't despite everything, it was because of everything, but that kind of thing. And for the Argentine, I mean, you, 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 this is what you are. You didn't choose it, so. Yeah, you can get, you can definitely get caught up in the passions, I think, yes, in Argentina. Exactly. As a it's foreigner, you know, I think yeah. it's something yeah. that characterizes all the foreigners that I've met living yeah. in Argentina or who choose to live in Argentina. Um, and who have the privilege often to come and go whenever we please is that uh, we're, we're, you know, deeply madly in love with a very complex country. It's a, it's a very romantic, complex connection. Uh, and it's something that will continue to draw people to Argentina, I think, into the future. It's a very stimulating, interesting place. And, 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 and there are things that happen there and, and that are happening in Argentina, which I think explain why it is a country that has set so many precedents in terms of the way uh, Argentine society has dealt with the past um, and really on, on their terms, not taking cues from Germany or from other you know, Latin American countries, but really setting a path forward that's based on Argentine idiosyncrasies and a very strong sense of self. I think it's a it's a remarkable place. On that um, note, we have several questions from the audience. And so I'm going to read them. And some of them are directed to specific people. Um, this one is from Christopher Neal. And it's to Bob. Um, I was a Canadian journalist filing on your testimony in Tribunales in 1985. It was unforgettable, and Jason's film reminded me why. Your transparent authenticity was so obvious, not least because of your emotional reaction. When you were first asked to testify, what went through your mind? How do you expect your testimony to play out? And what was your impression of the Junta trial at that time and in retrospect? I suddenly got a call and asked to go, and I was astonished. I, you know, I don't know to this day why, uh, but the team who were putting together the, the trials, which were unprecedented in the world and still unprecedented that, that a country puts its own military, when they were still powerful on trial, was pretty terrific. I went there and I, I, they, I met them and they said, well, uh, what did you do? And so I told my story and uh, roughly as I could. And then I, 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 I went to, I, I was always overcome by it because then I had to do it all over again. But uh, I was impressed. I, 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 I thought this is justice. It's not, wasn't perfect justice in the, that the, uh, and you know, some people on, on the right have criticized it and they shouldn't because this was not, there was no political, this was not political, this was about, it was about justice. This was bringing people to justice in the way that you could at that particular time, which was tremendously difficult because the military were all powerful. They could have decided that they wanted to defend their, their generals and their admirals who, who were in the dock there. But the evidence against them was so overwhelming that they couldn't quite do that, but they tried again and again to stop the, the justice moving forward. And I think we have to also recognize that the, the uh, uh, Kirchner government also carried that forward by ensuring that the trials continued because they were stopped because the military was so powerful, they threatened uh, Alphonsine. So he had to come up with other answers. How I felt, I mean, I'm still, I'm still very emotional about Argentina. I can't help but because it, it, it seems to me so possible that things can work out there, and and they should work out. And I, you know, I keep thinking a lot of empathy. Um, but you've got a problem with po politics. When politics comes into it, people use, and human rights is a difficult term to get. We must get some other 
term for this, not dehumanize, it shouldn't be. But if it's used politically, you can, you can destroy most of the things that you want to achieve. And it has been used politically. Uh, it probably always is and always will be, but you have to be aware of that. It's a wonderful question that you asked me because it did mean a lot to me to go there. And I, I was very surprised, didn't expect it to happen. Nearly had a nervous breakdown while I was at the trial. But as I say, I, I was impressed by it. it. It was a moving moment because there were these judges and they were all different political and they were wonderful. They were concerned and those, those judges lived under threats all the time while they were carrying out this. It's, it's a marvelous thing. People have written about it, probably not as much as they should. And perhaps Chris, if you were there, try and write about it. I think it's worth it. The, the trial itself, incredible. Anyway, thank you for the question. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, we have another question from Bill Kovari. Um, he says, I'm grateful to see this documentary and webinar. Thank you, Bob and Maud and Jason. Question, why was the junta's ultimate failure in the dirty war not was not more of a restraint on subsequent human rights abuses in other Latin American mm. countries? Excuse me, I have to go. Sorry, she's closer yes, sorry. than I am. Um, sorry, can you just repeat the last? Sure, sure. knocking at the door. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not the bad guys. Um, why was the Junta's ultimate failure in the dirty war more of a restraint on the subsequent human rights abuses in other Latin American countries? Hmm. I, I think because, well, for a start, when I went to, you know, I was there for the trial and I took a taxi one day and I said to him, are you following, because it was on the radio. Oh, he wasn't interested. People weren't interested. And also they only dared cover it in a limited form in Argentina at that time. So it's never had the impact. It never had yeah. the impact that it should have had everywhere else. Um, the other thing you've got to take into consideration is that one of the things that also is complex, because the Carter administration did wonders for Argentina. They saved thousands of lives, God knows how many, I don't know, Pat Derry and heroes, they, heroes they were against the, against the grain in the United States. They didn't like it at all. They wanted to, they were very happy with the military government. And uh, so it's, it's, so you didn't have the impact that it should have had, but it should have, and I think it eventually will, because I think it's a marvelous thing that's happened. And also, it's something that all Argentines should get together on. I think that they are finally doing that. You no longer have a, a reaction which continued for a long time, which just say it was false, that, that it was exaggerated, that it, the military wasn't as bad as all that, and it was not, not that nobody is accepted now. It's become Absolutely. accepted. This terrible thing happened. And people are pretty, pretty not as aware as they should be, but pretty well aware. In many ways, things are better after that in Argentina. I'm living, living all my life there. I've seen, you know, things are changing slowly, and some bad things come in between, but they are changing. Uh, for example, the censorship is not the censorship we had. And in the 40s or in the well, there 50s. isn't censorship no, now. There, is, there really there is, isn't any censorship. censorship. Now, now you get, I, I'm, I'm sure journalists, are, I, but they don't seem to be intimidated as much. Well, now uh, there might be personal intimidation, so that's a different story, but it's not the, uh, not the government that comes and does something. It might be people, you know, no, it's not the same. It's much, it's better. They can talk. They couldn't talk before. Yes, you might be bombarded by uh, these organization you know these uh, the, not the not the hackers what do they call them but groups of people who are, are putting force you know and they they're, they're trying to false information yeah false information trying to uh, give bad information about journalists and things like that but, but no, no and so that's something that, that's moved ahead um we i spent some time in in uh, guatemala where, and I sometimes wonder, you know, what happened there? Because there were some very, very noble people there fighting the same kind of fight as Argentina. This was when I was with the Inter-American Press Association. 
So one does, you know, I, I, we have two, two, two bad dictatorships in, in Latin, well, three, I suppose. Uh, but something we have to live with and then try and understand why things happen. I had a problem with one of the mothers of Blessed Imagine because she exalted when the triple, ta uh, triple towers were 9-11, the, 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 you know, the terrorist attack on, the, on New York. And she exalted in it. She thought it was a wonderful thing. And I had a problem with that. And, but I've been thinking recently, I was trying to understand what she lived through. It doesn't justify her saying that, but it helps me to understand her, how she could say a thing like that. And again, I was looking at a clip of um, well, no, the rough shot of uh, Jason's new film, and that reminded me so much of what they did go through. And suffering does seem to remain and causes people to be vindictive. Uh, so there are so many problems that are worth looking at. Um, and I hope they will be. And there's a lot to be learned from Margaret. That, that's what I feel very, very strongly about. Jason's work is going to be a lot to be learned from what he's doing. And I think I just wanted to quickly comment on something <clears throat> that was in the Q&A um, from uh, one of the participants um, who mentions how Bob, uh, after all these years, has still kept the focus on human rights. This is from uh, Mar Maria Jose Ferreira. And um, she says, you know, after many years, Bob maintains the focus in the substance of human rights. And I think, um, you know, really the, the risk or the opportunity that the history of Argentina has for the rest of the region and maybe even for the rest of the world is this unshakable focus on the idea of human rights. And I think the, the only risk is that it's become a little, you know, it's become wrapped up in the cultural wars of Argentina. You know, today, human rights is, is clearly seen as something that pertains to the left and, um, and, and, and it shouldn't, it doesn't. There are a lot of people in the center and on the right in Argentina who are also heavily involved in toppling the military in the cultural sense and, and really you know, turning the page in Argentina and, and opening the country up to democratic ideas and a democratic process. So I think there's an opportunity and a risk in, in the example set by Argentina. And some countries in the region have taken it up, you know, like Chile, for example, after the very long and complex Pinochet uh, regime has slowly started to turn to the judiciary to resolve some of the, you know, the underlying issues in that country. And, um, and, and I'm sure in the region, hopefully there'll be other countries that follow suit, you know, in Central America and Colombia, the phenomenon of forced disappearances is still uh, as strong as ever. And, um, you know, hopefully the Argentine example will help those countries transition out of the horror. Um, and I think, I think, you know, the example's there to be taken. Thank you, Jason. Um, we have a couple more questions um, from Abe Lowenthal. Maud mentioned Tex Harris, a US embassy officer who worked on human rights. How should we understand the U.S. role by the government and civil society in those years of Argentine history? Well, I think this proves that one person can make a great difference. Uh, one of the things the United States has is they have they do of all the countries so far in the world is one country that lets you talk and lets you be who you are. Uh, I don't know well the policies at that moment, but you had two different policies. You had the politics of Carter, and then you had, the, you had the Reagan years, which were different. But I think Tex Harris was Tex Harris. And in, in any moment, he would have done what he had to do because he had that feeling, which is so important. I think people are getting it more, I think, uh, that there's certain things you do not do. I mean, you can cross, you can discuss it, you can, you know, you can make mistakes, you might put someone to prison that shouldn't be in prison, all that can happen. But you have always a right to fight it and to show it. And there's certain things, and I think Tex Harris, coming from the way he was, the upbringing he had, he had it very strong in his mind. 
what's happening in the States was the only thing at that moment, you had two different, we had a Pocata, you had the Democrat, and then you had the uh, Reagan years, which had a complete different uh, out view. But I think that um, you can work through it because that's one, one good, very good thing in the States, you can still work through, it, you know, and he, he was a human person that understood, he had the empathy and he understood the future. He wanted the future for his country because he really loved his country. So he actually was very proud that he could be able to do this. This is the way he thought the country should go. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's well, do you have anything to add? No, that's very, very true what Norman says. And he also studied the whole thing and he worked it all out and understood. I mean, and uh, you know, what happened was, uh, the military to begin with started to use the French Algiers, Algiers uh, way of dealing with, in that case, the independence of, of Algiers, and they used those methods in Argentina. He, he had it all worked out very well, and he was just a marvelous person in that way. He opened, it was un, again unheard of really, he opened the doors of the embassy to, to everybody to come and the mothers who had nowhere to go found a door opened for them in the US Embassy when all the other doors were closed. That part of it is a pity that it is not understood completely. And, and But I, I know people in Argentina who who have photographs of, of Carter on the wall. I think it's more understood because they in Argentina got out than of here. Jail. I think, I think they owe their lives to him. And that's another, you know, it's, it's hard to get all those things together. Yes, you know, when people are prejudiced, it's very hard. No, but I think he is where they don't understand what he's done. I think in Argentina, yeah, no, he's on it. He's yeah. much more appreciated. Yeah. 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 Did he have to leave with the Reagan administration? No. Um, yes, they moved. They, they moved. They, 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 yeah, they pulled him back. They pulled him back. But they pulled him back, and for a while, it looked as if he wouldn't get any promotion. But eventually, he was recognized for what he did, which was tremendous. I mean, he was a, not only brave, but what a diplomat should do, you know. He, he reported what was happening, and and he strongly defended uh, U.S. principle, which is in defense of human rights. Which Carter, it's there. I mean, you know, we in the United States, uh, I guess Trump can ignore it, but I don't think any other regime, any not regime, any other government <laughs> ignores <laughs> or ignores human rights. Yeah, we have another question here from Bill Kovarik about the press. Is if the if the press don't respond to aren't covering a situation of human rights, and he's talking in the context of today, are other groups such as RSF or the Committee to Protect Journalists or the IEPA, do they create more of a buffer than what you were finding during your time in Argentina. Oh, yes, and this is some, it's another lesson that I learned from Argentina, that the more, I mean, journalists need to have their own organizations, that there, there was nobody to, you know, there's nobody to pull, pull things together in Argentina among those working journalists who quite would have liked to have reported on it, but they weren't allowed to, they couldn't. But if, if at that time you'd had Again, out, outside help was enormously helpful in those days. They, they didn't exist. We didn't have a, a committee for the protection of journalists in those days. Argentina was it was before you had lots of things that should make a difference. They don't always make a difference because journalists are still being murdered all over the world. But uh, that certainly would have helped enormously in, in Argentina, enormously. I used to wish that there was something like that. And so that's, we used to be so happy when anybody came from outside that we could talk to. Yeah. Um, one more question here, which we touched on a bit earlier, but he asking why was the Buenos Aires Herald not shut down by the Argentine government? Um, I can only wonder why. Um, one, one reason was that they wanted to look good for the United States. They needed, they needed the United States for, for, uh, for arms, very important to them. They wanted to keep that open. 
they wanted to they believed that they were working for the United States in their way, in that they were saving Western civilization. Um, and it would have looked bad for them if they if they had shut down the Herald, I think. And I think also many- well, I don't really know. <laughs> I think many of the embassies have always used to read the Herald for the language because- They could they... have swatted us like a fly at one point. But then after a while, people, read the paper that hadn't read it before, and diplomats would pick it up. Um, Yuki Goni, one of the great young journalists that we had there, was astonished when he went to have his uh, a tire fixed. He needed a new tire for his car, and he saw on the wall pinned up Herald Editorial. By law in Argentina, we had to publish the editorials in Spanish as well as English which was a bit of a bother for us, but it was a law that dated back to Perón's time, but it turned out to be very useful because people would get hold of the paper, buy the paper just for the editorial in, in, in Spanish, ah, gave, uh -huh. gave them information that they needed. So that's certainly- I, um, <clears throat> I have a theory about this, and I don't know if you would agree with it, Bob, but I think, um, you know, the what Bob and his team at the Herald were doing um, with, you know, the support of people like Maud as well, kind of this, this beacon of, of sanity, I think you were, Maud, in that context, um, really keeping your eye on what was important. Um, I think what happened at the Herald is that a lot of the groundwork for the investigative reporting and the brave decisions to publish the stories of the disappeared or, or, or testimonies by the mothers on the front page, a lot of that initial groundwork is kind of happening in the shadows of the military taking power. And that's because the Herald in 1976 is, you know, a fairly small community newspaper, which I don't think was naturally on the radar of the military in terms of being a potential risk. So a lot of the stuff that Bob and his colleagues were able to do happened kind of on the sidelines of those initial months and years of terror. And by the time the military kind of recognized that the Herald had become in its own way, a point of reference for a lot of people in Argentina, it was almost too late to stop it because already by that stage, by, you know, 77, 78, Bob was, um, you know, it, he was reporting internationally, all the, all the embassies knew who he was. I think, you know, you kind of had built up a little network of protection. People were aware of you and they were, they were keeping their eye on you as much as they could. And um, I think, you know, I, I get the feeling that the military missed their opportunity to shut the Herald down. Um, and it, it really has to do with, with how the Herald evolved and also what was happening in a country that was managed by, you know, some crazy men you know they really like i said before the military the the army didn't know what the navy was doing the navy didn't know what the air force was doing um so you know who was keeping their eye on a small english language newspaper um no one really uh, and until the herald became what it became well, yes. you know, I, I had a friend who you know who was a member of the government quite high up and he would warn me when he'd hear the generals talking in a way that, and he'd say, well, Bob, you better be careful because I don't know that they would actually, but they, one of the, one of them might decide to do something. And, uh, you know, and the, so then we would try to publish something that would shut them up for a while and say how nice it was that they were planting flowers in Paso de Majo and things like that, because you had to keep, you know, the balance was mentioned earlier on. That was part of the balance to also, applaud them if we could find things to applaud them for, which one of which was that if they beautified Plaza de Maggio, of course, that was an ulterior motive, and they thought that they wouldn't be able to have mass meetings there when all they had flower beds everywhere. But that was essentially what it was. You're, you're, you're right there. I mean, it, it came and went. The dangers came and went. And, and perhaps some of the dangers were very early on when they raided us with machine guns, but they went to the wrong place first. And so we knew they were coming. And then, so we dealt with them as, you know, it's they're funny stories that, there too, that, that eventually you look back on 
there were funny stories that saved us, quite frankly. At one time, the, uh, the Montoneros, the, uh, the strange, I think, strange combination of whatever it is, I don't know, uh, that uh, they thought of bombing us and killing one of our members, but they didn't get around to it, fortunately. But there was, you know, that's the... Uh, yeah. Well, we're almost about to wrap up. Um, Kristen, do you have anything to add? Um, I have a question I've been dying to ask Jason. And it's not one of these ponderous, you know, human rights or press freedom questions. It's just watching the documentary for the third time when you know the plot and you're watching the way it's made. I was just intrigued by the music you chose. Could you talk about that for a minute? Wonderful music, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, there's nothing really, I don't have anything um, revealing, to be honest, to say about the music aside from um, the fact that I had a very small team and we didn't really know what we were doing, to be honest. Like, Everyone who worked on the film, it was kind of the first um, feature length documentary that we'd worked on. And um, I kind of just said to the musicians, you know, like here is the material and, and, and compose what you feel, you know, compose what you feel basically. And I think the story, the way that I, that I approached it um, in, in the, pre-production and production stages uh, and even to this day watching it it's it's such I feel you know um you know I feel like breaking down and having a big cry you know and I think the mu the musicians um responded to that as well and so yeah I think everyone who worked on it the musicians myself um we we you know felt this really strong emotional connection to to Bob's journey and I think that's reflected in the story it's um that's one of the reasons that Kirsten brought up before about, you know, there's some ambiguity in the, the kind of more political academic nuance that exists in Argentine history. We don't really touch on that. And I think part of the reason why that was the case is we were really wanted to lean into the emotional side of things and bring an Argentine audience around, you know, to the same table, which is that ultimately this is, uh, uh, something so horrendous and something so painful and you know there needs to be mourning we need to mourn and grieve uh, for, for what happened in Argentina first and foremost and then maybe we can sit down together and look at each other in the eye and talk about some of the more complex aspects of the story where we might not necessarily agree um, and I think in Argentina that we achieved that. We were able to do that. We were able to get a diverse group of people to come to the cinema and in the Q&As afterwards have some really, um, you know, frank but generous and calm discussions about what is portrayed in the film. And I think um, for me personally, that's the biggest achievement of, of the whole project was, was what happened in the screenings in Argentina. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm afraid we are all out of time. And I want to thank each and every one of you, Bob, Maud, Jason, Kristen. And it's just been such a wonderful experience. And I want to shout out also to Jimena um, for helping put this together and um, it's a pleasure for all of us to have been here with you. Thank you. Well, it's yeah. been a pleasure for us, and I think it's important what you're doing, and I'm very grateful for it. You do lots more of other things. And, uh, the world needs you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.